As the 1990s began to bloom within Japan and the lost decade began to unfurl slowly, the Rari Denude appeared to be in their death throes. No recordings had surfaced of the band and their live performance schedule had dried up substantially. Then in 1992, apropos of absolutely nothing, a documentary about the band appeared in the wild. Directed by the elusive French director Ethan Mousquet, the self-titled film Le Rari de Nude presents its own cavalcade of confusion. Supposedly, Musique came from France to build the band, to which Mizutani agreed under the condition that the directors would film no direct interviews nor direct interaction with the band. Julian Cope claims that Musique even paid for this trip and film on his own without any help from the band. By placing these restrictions on Musique, Mizutani only allowed peripheral recording of live performances and backstage activity of the band, leading the resulting film to appear as something of an ambient film. It's abstract to say the least, especially as an observational documentary. But let's rewind a moment before we look into the film further and ask a few important questions. Who is Ethan Musique? Where is he now? And why, after decades of not providing interviews or behind-the-scenes footage, or even proper recordings of their music, why would Takashi Mizutani and company all of a sudden let some random filmmaker get close to the band, even if this closeness is, realistically speaking, still pretty far off? The truth of the matter is, no one seems to know who Ethan Musike is. The jacket for the incredibly rare VHS of the film confirms that this is, indeed, the name of the elusive filmmaker. A quick internet search of his name provides only a handful of mentions to the documentary and articles concerning the band themselves which mention the documentary as a side note, not to mention the various VHS rips of the film uploaded across the internet. Movie databases list the 1992 film as Musique's only work, Though, of course, we've learned over the years of producing this show that these websites can be incredibly spotty, especially with more obscure releases from territories outside the United States. In all likelihood, Musique could be a real person who put together the film as a youthful project before returning to France and disappearing into obscurity, perhaps never touching the film medium again. The other major possibility, and the one to which we would subscribe more wholeheartedly, is that Ethan Musique is, in fact, a pseudonym. Who for? Well... Who have we already mentioned that has a huge interest in France, French language, literature, and culture? Yeah, in our opinion, Ethan Musique is likely none other than Takashi Mizutani, as adopting this name would allow him to simultaneously pay homage to his French branding, keeping his own name off an actually released project, and heighten the mystique of the band. Dr. Cummings seems to agree with us on this point, saying, quote, My best guess is that the name is a pseudonym, possibly for Mizutani himself. The way that film is edited, with deliberate disjunctures between the sound and the visuals, seems suspiciously close to the band's musical approach." End quote. Naturally, the film must have been shot by someone else, given Mizutani appearing on screen front and center throughout. But as it turns out, Musique is Greek for music, with the French pronunciation of the word sounding quite similar. Some claim assertively that the director doesn't exist, or is Mizutani himself, pointing to an interview from the early 90s where Mizutani spoke on making a film. As per usual, there is no direct confirmation on Ethan Musique's identity, but this lines up with what both Dr. Cummings and ourselves believe. Speaking of the mystique around the band and Musique, information is scarce, but it appears that the film was only ever released on VHS way back in 1992. Given how out of print this makes the film, and the status the band has achieved since the inception of the internet, copies that crop up from time to time on Yahoo auctions fetch upwards of several hundred dollars. The film is readily available online in the form of VHS rips, like we said, and has appeared in public screening form from time to time over the years, but a re-release of the project seems… unlikely, let's say. So enough about the film from an outside perspective, what is the documentary like itself? Le Rari de Nude is something of a fever dream, operating in lengthy live segments juxtaposed with short bursts of backstage footage and other concerts. Often, the subjects of the film are completely out of focus. When performing, the band is shown in short bursts during the implementation of their total sensory assault. The light show we mentioned previously, which the band borrowed from Gendai Gekijo. One song at a time, sometimes for a few short minutes and sometimes for tens of minutes, Mizutani and company wail on. The funny thing is, everyone but Mizutani himself is near indistinguishable. Over the course of the film, we got the sense that this project was no doubt spearheaded by Mizutani as he is the only real subject of the film. 
The story of the band typically goes that Mizutani called the shots, deciding on the band's image and sound, as well as being the one to turn down any opportunities for interviews. It was also no doubt Mizutani who kept the band from releasing a proper album or film until the early 1990s, given that he was the only consistent member throughout the band's entire run. With how much screen time is spent on the man, whether he's hidden behind dizzying tracers, nauseating shaky cam, or hazy strobe lights, it becomes hard to ignore that this is a large part of Mizutani's legacy. We are unsure when any given concert footage might have been shot, meaning that this was likely cobbled together over the course of several years or several decades. Much like the albums which had just been released at long last, this documentary was a method of Takashi Mizutani controlling how he would be seen following the collapse of the band. In other words, long after Le Rally de la Day might fade into obscurity, by placing his image so thoroughly into this project, it would add another wrinkle into the lengthy mythical history of not just Le Rally de la Day, but Mizutani himself. In other words, while we don't have any interview evidence of this, we firmly believe that this documentary is something of a vanity project for Takaji Mizutani, which portrays him in the light he wanted to be seen, while maintaining his complete obscurity of character or thought. Around the time of the release of this documentary, the band finally, after 24 years, released their first official recordings into the world. Despite hours upon hours of material being recorded, the band didn't dump a massive catalog into the world. Instead, they released three albums in 1991, Mizutani, 6769 Studio and Live, and 77 Live, with the final of these releases being arguably their most important and impactful. Supposedly, the first two were dropped on August 15th, 1991, while the release date of the third is left somewhat obscure. As you can likely tell from the titles, these three albums represented a variety of time periods for the band. All three were produced by Revista Incorporated, a label which has otherwise been inactive save a 2011 box set of the band's work named Revista Archives. Following this flurry of activity between 1991 and 1992, the band remained active but mostly under the radar until 1996. On October 4th at Club Kita in Kawasaki, the band is reported to have played a set of eight songs, ending the set list and their public career with the last one. Around the same time, in the mid-90s, Mizutani played alongside the band Shizuka, fronted by Shizuka Miyota, who took influence from Le Rari Denede, among others, with her own group. Video of this performance has since resurfaced online, proving to be, as far as we know, the final evidence of Mizutani on record. In 1997, he recorded a live album with Arthur Doyle and drummer Sabu Toyozumi, titled Live in Japan 1997. The album was released by Cubico in 2003, by which point Mizutani had receded into obscurity. Reports indicate that Takaji Mizutani was alive as of 2016, and either living in Paris or Tokyo, hiding out from fear of government monitoring. But these claims have never been substantiated, and in the five years since, no further word has been provided concerning Mizutani. According to the questionable account of Julian Cope, Takashi Mizutani attended Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan for psychology and French literature. He reportedly rejected American liberalism in favor of a stronger French influence. Again, reportedly, as many Japanese intellectuals of the 1960s were prone to doing. Mizutani began his tenure at Doshisha in 1967, according to this account of events. At the time, French contemporary culture offered kids like Mizutani an outlet for political thought, a well of culture to draw upon, and a shared post-war experience of having their countries destroyed in World War II. Due to this amount of shared interest, Japanese adolescent interest in France led to what Cope calls a shared sense of existentialist nihilism. Before converting to psychedelia and noise, Mizutani initially took to folk music as protest against Americanization in post-war Japan. Japan, though this quickly broke down accordingly into a more nihilistic sound for his nihilistic outlook on life. Throughout the years, particularly after the 1970 Yorigo incident, Mizutani became the only consistent member of Le Rari de Nude. Unfortunately, thanks to a lack of official or authoritative records on the band, as far as we can tell, no definitive list of all members who have participated exists. We know at least 15 of the participants of Le Rari de Nude. But, given the short stints of some of them, who can say how many more may have come and gone over the decades? 
Supposedly, in addition to being a recluse who avoided interviews, Mizutani was a perfectionist, a hard-headed guy, and someone who was all-around difficult to work with. These qualities may inform why the band's turnover was as rapid and massive as it became. One writer even argues that the underground music of the 1980s was perfectly conducive to their sound, meaning that Le Rari de Nude were about 20 years ahead of their time. By the decade when their time to shine eventually rolled around, Mizutani was a total hermit, and the band's appearances were slowing down, meaning that he was becoming disconnected from the music world, a position in which he has remained to this day. In his elusiveness, rumor has painted the life story of Takashi Mizutani. If our sources are to be believed, he'll occasionally talk to journalists through nighttime faxes, and rumors fly from Paris to Tokyo to Kyoto regarding his residence. Those who might have some contact with him are willing to say things like, quote, I think he's still under the impression that secret forces are aligning to incarcerate him, and that these may take any form, hence the mistrust across the board. End quote. Heightening this air of mystery. A YouTube comment on another video regarding the band claims that Mizutani is alive and well in Kyoto, as well as that he has authorized all the Univive releases. Reportedly, the band is not as well loved in Japan as they are abroad, and modern musicians either don't know them or don't really care about them. For a time, underground musicians like Shizuka paid tribute to Mizutani and company, but today these bands are fewer and further between. Mizutani was also alleged to be a silent rival of Keiji Haino, another drone, noise, and psychedelic musician, who remains active and prolific to this day. Some suggest that Haino was one of those older guard of musicians to be greatly influenced by Mizutani and Renari Denude. The story goes that Haino quickly became internationally famous where Mizutani was never quite able to, thus making Mizutani develop a lifelong grudge. Musician Bloom explains that Mizutani tried to record an album within the last decade, but as always couldn't finish it, as seems to be the running standard with him. Alternatively, Jojo Hiroshige says that he knows Mizutani is alive and willing to continue working on Rerari Denude, though nothing further has developed from this claim. As it was put in the essay, In Search of Le Rari de Nude by Grayson Haver Curran, one of the most thorough and well-regarded pieces on the band in English, quote, Regarding Mizutani, for instance, credible sources variably say he's mentally ill, near death, staging a comeback, or simply jealous of the exposure other Japanese musicians have received after he receded from public view. I've also been told that his father was an extremely well-paid executive at the tire company Bridgestone, and that Mizutani agreed to release recordings through Japan's experimental bastion PSF, only if owner Hideo Ikezumi would change the name to something that better reflected Le Rari de Nude's aesthetic." End quote. Others claim that sources close to the former band members have stated Mizutani is alive and well in Kyoto, now being in his 70s. These claims aren't verified, but then again, what is with this band? We need to take a moment to jump back in time now that we've explored the timeline of Le Rari de Nude from the beginning to end. This section could have been nestled much earlier in this analysis of the band, but it likely would have derailed the proceedings given how much time it might take up. On that note, let's take a few minutes to go almost all the way back to the beginning and settle on that fateful day of March 31st, 1970. Of most of the band's members, Moriyaki Wakabayashi is, ironically, the easiest about whom we can find information. We say ironically because, as you may recall, Wakabayashi was the band member to disappear into North Korea all those years ago. The Yorigo incident was named after the plane hijacked by a sect of the Red Army faction involving Wakabayashi. Once taken over by the Red Army faction, this Japan Airlines flight was intended for redirection to Cuba. However, once the hijackers and their captives arrived in Pyongyang, they were granted asylum by the North Korean government, and not allowed to proceed to Cuba. More or less, Kim Il-sung's regime kept the Yorigo hijackers captive, while quickly rushing them away from the capital. For reference, we should note that the Yorigo hijacking occurred in an era where this type of terrorist activity wasn't common. In fact, the incident played host to a number of odd elements, with the Red Army faction using toys to take over the plane, and referencing manga in their statement to the world. What's more, most of the Red Army faction's upper crust, including leader Takaya Shiomi, had been nabbed earlier, meaning that this event came as a surprise for the presumed dead group. Matters have remained complicated to this day for the Yorigo hijackers. As Shiomi said of the group, quote, 
1970, I got 20 years and they escaped to Pyongyang. I envied them then, but maybe I was the lucky one. My time in prison is over. The rest have it all still waiting for them." End quote. Because as it turns out, those sequestered in North Korea 50 years ago have remained there to this day. On the day of the incident, the Red Army faction might not have made it to Cuba, but truth be told, they almost didn't make it to North Korea even. Initially, the plane was grounded in Fukuoka, but was soon able to lift off, only to be held up a second time, this time in Seoul, South Korea. The second stop was a sting operation perpetrated by American and South Korean agents. Together, these forces pretended that Seoul was Pyongyang, thus encouraging the group to make contact. Once the plot was figured out, the Americans and South Koreans almost rushed the plane to take it back, but were unsuccessful. Once the plane got back in the air and headed further north, these unexpected guests made their way for Pyongyang. We say unexpected because North Korea had not been contacted by the Yodogo group beforehand. This means that a group of domestic turned international terrorists showed up on their doorstep causing issues for the Hermit Kingdom out of the blue. Luckily, the civilians aboard the flight were released prior to heading out of Japan and South Korea, and the North Korean regime allowed the Japan Airlines crew to go home. Once all those caught in the mix were taken care of, North Korea put the Yorogo group up in a hotel before transferring them to an area known as the Japanese Village. Initially, this village given to the group was called Revolution Village, but it was later renamed Japanese Village, after the members of the Red Army faction underwent re-education by the North Korean government. During their detention in North Korea, for publicity and for the sake of embarrassing Japan, the group were publicly given medals and an audience with Kim Il-sung, the contemporary leader of the country. Inside the Yodogo group's Revolution Village, North Korean officials would have us believe that life was sweet for its residents. The group were provided an international phone line, at least one computer, satellite receivers, cars, and nice if somewhat austere dorms. Though they were never provided an internet connection. Of course, when you consider the extremely small population with internet access in the country, this is understandable. Originally, William Andrews of the blog Throw Out Your Books says that the group had a personal staff and luxury cars to keep them satiated, and to keep them from breaking out, but that over time, these luxuries were stripped away. Inside Revolution Village, the Yodogo group were indoctrinated into Juche, the state ideology of North Korea, first implemented by Kim Il-sung following the Korean War and the country's founding. Information about the group's lives since being taken in is largely propagandistic in nature, and has dried up over the years. Not all was convenient and happy, however, as it has been reported that at least one member and his wife died during an apparent escape attempt from North Korea. As it turns out, at least a few members had Japanese wives brought into the country covertly in the mid-1970s, some of whom have remained in the Japanese village years later. It's also been alleged that the notorious North Korean abductions of Japanese citizens throughout the 1970s and 1980s might also have been related to the Yodogo group, though this connection has never been, and realistically never will be, confirmed. Regardless, it's a piece of the story which should be noted when considering the background and impact of the Yodogo incident as a whole. Over the many years since the initial plane jacking, some original members and their spouses made it back to Japan in one way or another. Yasuhiro Shibata and his ex-wife, for example, showed up out of the blue in Japan in 1988, while Yoshimi Tanaka was found elsewhere in Asia. At its height, Revolution Village boasted a population of 36 residents, and while exact figures don't exist, their numbers are now believed to be about six. The spouses and children of the hijackers were allowed to return to Japan in 2002, but the remaining members are stuck in North Korea to this day. A 2002 article in The Guardian erroneously reported that Wakabayashi was in this group to return, though this was proven wrong as of late through the group's expressed want to get back home. In 2017, a website known as Yorogo Nihonjin Mura was created by the group and anonymous assistants to tell the world about their desire to return home. Through photos on the website, it has been confirmed that Wakabayashi was still alive in the rebranded Japanese village as recently as 2017. The group also maintains a blog on the site and a Twitter account which are both updated regularly, but as far as we can tell, no news has arrived concerning the group's release and potential return to Japan. Lerari Denude only released three records officially, all of which arrived three decades ago this year. 
some fans have argued as the band's profile rose once more in cult circles that this lack of albums came about because of how disappointed Mizutani was with any and all attempts to record a proper studio album. From their first attempt with the Virgin Records, to the supposed second attempt at recording in 1980, nothing ever panned out completely. In spite of this, a number of albums and compilations have appeared over the years from bootleggers and small labels alike. Two descriptors which are not mutually exclusive in the case of this cryptic band. All albums which have appeared are bootlegs. From live recordings, to soundboards, to studio demos. None of it is official. Studio recordings do exist, but are all over the place in terms of recording years. For example, Mars Studio 1980 was put to tape between September 4th and September 9th, and consists of about two and a half hours of material. France Demo Tapes is credited as being recorded in the 1980s most likely, and runs at only about half an hour. In terms of official releases, matters are not much better. Dr. Cummings claimed in his 1999 article about the band that three CDs and a video of live and studio recordings spanning 1967 to 1977 appeared simultaneously. He went on to claim that these handful of projects were released in quantities limited to several hundred, a trend carried over into most of the modern bootlegs from the band. Dr. Cummings comments that even by the mid-1990s, when he was able to track down some of the official releases in Ikebukuro, they were already too overpriced for him to take a risk on them. His only reprieve back then was to become invested in the cassette swapping scene, where he was able to come across bootlegs of some releases. The limited status of public releases means that whether you're approaching the band from an official or illicit angle, you're going to be shelling out a handful of cash for any physical copies of their work, though admittedly the bulk of their catalog is quite easily available on this very website. As for those bootleg releases, the majority have come from a notorious label known as Phoenix Records. Phoenix has direct ties with James Plummer, a man who has been active in the music bootlegging scene for years on end. Yet we must ask, where did someone like Plummer acquire such a vast collection of unreleased audio from a band like Le Rari de Nude, who were mostly unknown to an English-speaking audience until Phoenix started dropping their releases in quick succession. Grayson Haver Curran, writing for Red Bull Music Academy, explained, quote, I've been told that all the live bootlegs that have eked out through various labels during the past two decades were actually padding Mizutani's pockets. And I've been told that Keiji Haino and Mizutani were briefly in a blue cheer cover band together, though no recordings have ever surfaced." End quote. We usually wouldn't defer to a source like this, but given the mythical and in many cases legendary nature of Le Rari de Nude, we figured it was worth mentioning. In short, Japanese Wikipedia says that in 2000, a user known as Disaster009 showed up on Yahoo Auctions, selling sets of 10 CDs at a time of the band's material. These CDs were supposedly higher quality than any previously discovered bootlegs, and when all sold, totaled 70 CDRs. No one knows exactly who Disaster009 was, but some fans believe it to be Mizutani, or at least someone close to the band. These bootlegs may have been the source of Phoenix's releases. Between 2001 and 2012, the label Univive also showed up selling even more high-quality recordings that had never been released before. These albums are noted by fans for being higher quality than Disaster 009's recordings in some cases, as though they've been remixed and properly finished. Similar to the stories about Disaster 009, some argue that Univive is run by a former member of the band's technical crew, who might have had access to better recordings. The question arises then, if these aren't bootlegs of other recordings, then who is supplying them? Even today, most bootlegs seem to be repurposed earlier material that stayed hidden for decades, but which has been released a few times at this point. But every now and again, new material slips through. Some have made the claim that Mizutani is co-signing these releases, though of course we'll never have a straight answer on this. As Dr. Cummings explained from his perspective, quote, I had always heard that those three releases and the video were official releases. The rumors around the Univive releases was that they were connected to an engineer or PA guy who worked with the band for a long time. Difficult to say whether they were bootleg though. The Yahoo auction stuff definitely was bootlegs, and it feels to me like the Univive stuff appeared in response to it." End quote. In terms of actual sound, Le Rari de Nude has long been noted for their screechiness, their walls of noise, and their psychedelic funk found throughout. 
They played the same few dozen songs over and over, year after year, not often changing their set lists in any drastic manner. They perfected these various songs over decades of practice, drilling them with numerous different members and lineups and never truly dissolving. The band are also remembered for their live antics, such as the theatrics mentioned earlier. Perhaps most well remembered was an open air festival played by the band in 1976. As the story goes, a typhoon stopped the festival where they were set to perform. Legend has it that a video, which has long circulated, records a fragment of their set when they went on in spite of the bad weather. The legendary part of the story relates to how the organizers wanted them to keep their volume down for fear of an avalanche, but that the band got up to their normal antics anyway. According to Julian Cope, this festival was called Sunset Glow and was held at a ski resort. Cope seems to have originated or at least spread the rumor about the avalanche and turning down the volume to prevent it. Dr. Cummings and the band's liner notes author both confirm that this event happened, but the linear notes point the blame at the third Twilight Glow Festival, or the Yuyake Matsuri in Japanese, closing toward the promoters. They explain that days one and two were ruined by the storm, while Rerari Denu Day played their set on the third day. However, only after a 20 minute set, the promoters cut the power to the festival in order to force everyone off the mountain. The story about the Ski Lodge Festival represents just one of the myriad elements of Lerari Denude's legend. We've chosen to spend a minimal amount of time in this video discussing the band's sound and instead focus on these elements. Music is something personal to each individual listener. It's something that neither of us have any experience attempting to describe or critique. It's something that we both love, but which is utterly foreign in certain regards. For this reason, we chose to use this video to discuss what history concerning the band we could uncover, rather than anything about their actual music. And yet at the end of the video, we have to ask ourselves, what did we even learn? What can we actually confirm about Takashi Mizutani, Lerari Denude, Ethan Mozike, or anyone else attached to the band? And the truth is, well, who knows? It's all hearsay. They're all stories and legends and myths. Maybe it's all made up, constructed by Mizutani way back when to ensure a sense of mystique, to guarantee longevity for the impact of his pet project. Maybe it's all true, even the parts that contradict one another and sound too fantastical to be true. It's the most frustrating story we've encountered, and yet it begs to be told. It's a fascinating narrative, full of twists and turns, back alleys, and broad agreed upon highways. Perhaps Grayson Haver Curran put it best about halfway through his seminal article on the band, when he said, quote, but who knows which of these scenarios are true? Asking someone to verify a story about Lerari Denude feels like hoping someone shared the dream you had last night. For all I have been told about Lerari Denude, and it's a lot, I feel like I have learned almost nothing." End quote. It's a good story, but when all's said and done, perhaps we shouldn't bog ourselves down too much with the minutia of the band's history. Maybe we should just enjoy the music. That's why we're all here in the first place, isn't it?